All right, welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. We're in the book of Revelation, chapter 9. We'll begin reading in verse 7. And we'll pick up where we left off uh, last Wednesday. The Bible says, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their face their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. They had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. And let's pray, Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together this evening. Thank you for your word, for giving it to us and preserving it perfect. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us understanding of it and help us to uh, know more about you and about Jesus, for we ask it all in his name. Amen. All right, so last week we, we began, uh, well, uh, not last week we began, but when we began this chapter, uh, we we're given uh, a description of something that takes place of these beings coming out of the bottomless pit. Now, these are spiritual beings or demonic beings. These are angels that uh, uh, did not keep their their God-given position. They, they didn't keep their first estate, so they've been locked up. For all this time. Keep in mind there were other angels that followed Satan's authority and as he was cast out of heaven they followed him and they are right now uh, roaming about to and fro. They're, uh, they're in our atmosphere. The Bible calls Satan the prince of the power of the air and uh, uh, you know it's interesting all of our communication travels through the air. It's all airwaves and uh, so he's very good at uh, Twisting communication, causing miscommunication, things like that. It all goes through his domain. Uh, <clears throat> but these are not demons necessarily that were under his authority, uh, under his control, under his rule. They uh, fall into a different category. Uh, some people have tried to make these into uh, some mechanical device. I know some uh, prophets or some scholars, uh, prophecy, so-called experts, have said that uh, this is describing a helicopter. Well, let's look at the description of them. First of all, uh, their shapes are quite hideous. Um, if if I could draw, I would uh, <laughs> I would draw what is described up here. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll just use our imaginations. First of all, it says uh, they're like horses prepared for battle, and some type of gold-colored crown upon their head. Uh, <clears throat> well, helicopters are not like horses. I haven't seen them with crowns, so certainly not golden ones. It says their faces are like men. Uh, um, well, again, uh, that, that doesn't match the description. These are, these are a, a being like we haven't seen before. It's, it's not a mechanical device. It's not some type of machine. This is a spiritual being. Uh, it says their hair like women, their teeth like uh, the teeth of lions, uh, breastplate of iron, uh, and their sting is in the tail like a scorpion. Uh, <clears throat> the sound of their wings is like that of many chariots as they rush towards battle. Uh, now, that one part right there would, would describe, I guess, helicopters there. Uh, their rotors do make a very loud noise. But this says their sting is in their tails. And with that sting, they torment men. And that torment, uh, that tormenting lasts for five months. And it's, it's something that makes men long for death and wish that they could die. And they seek it, but they don't find it. And, and, and so they're, uh, after five months, they, they seem to recover from it. But during that five months, it, it is such a horrible experience, such a horrible thing that they would rather be dead than to go through any more of that. They do have a sovereign over them. They do have a leader, uh, a ruler. In the Hebrew uh, uh, tongue, his name means destruction. Uh, 
the Greek translation of his name means destroyer. So basically the same thing. That's a uh, uh, that's what he is here for. That's uh, uh, <clears throat> that's what he's he's leading them and sending them forth to do. And so they also keep in mind. And people say, well, see the language that that this was written in, and God gave it to us in the Greek language, uh, which at the time was the most exact language on the planet. Uh, didn't have words like we have now so they didn't have the word helicopter so John had to had to use the words that he did have to describe what he saw well uh, okay I, I get that but uh, uh, <clears throat> still the words that he used if, if you draw what he has described you don't end up with a helicopter and and, and so this is, like I said, this is not a mechanical uh, object. These are, these are beings that have been locked up in the bottomless pit for thousands of years now. And, and they're waiting their day to be released. Let's, let's read on. Verse 12. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Also, let me, let me back up just a little bit. Uh, keep in mind, John didn't come up with this to write it. And so the, the, this isn't John trying to put things in his words. These are the very words that God has given us. John was merely the pen in God's hand as, as this book is being written. <clears throat> so now, there certainly has not been any exaggeration of the horrors of the coming judgment uh, upon the earth. Um, our mind has a hard time understanding uh, such a severe judgment uh, would, would be appropriate for anything. Uh, <clears throat> and, and we read this and what's going to happen and everything. We say that that's harsh. That's awful harsh. That to us, it may seem like it's going too far. Uh, but keep in mind, our ways are not God's ways and our thoughts are not God's thoughts. And, and really, how could we know what it meant to give his only begotten son. God knows what that's like. We don't know what that's like. Uh, how could we know what it meant for one who is sinless to become sin? And, and then for that sacrifice and that, that giving of himself to be discarded and to be uh, scorned and, and just uh, uh, not valued at all, but trampled underfoot and, and hated even. How could we know what, the, uh, <clears throat> what transpired on the cross. That separation for the first time in, in, in all time, in all eternity, whether it be eternity past or eternity future, where God the Father and God the Son were separated. How could we know what it would be like for God the Father to hear Jesus say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so with, by not being able to understand that, that creates a situation for us not being able to understand the judgment that's going to be poured out on, on mankind that has rejected Jesus. Now remember, all these people <clears throat> are unsaved people. These are people that have not accepted Christ as their Savior. They've heard preaching. There's been witnesses that have gone on. And there, there have been people that have gotten uh, saved at this time in, in, in prophecy. Uh, and they won't be affected by these, these locusts. Uh, it's not going to come upon them. And so uh, these are things, this, this type of uh, uh, situation is only one that God would understand. And so his punishment is going to be in accordance to the sin that's been committed. This prophecy here, let, let's go back to the book of Joel, uh, chapter 2. Joel, chapter 2. That's in the Old Testament. Um, it's tucked in there between Hosea and Amos. Joel chapter 2. Let me read verse, begin in verse 4. And let's see if there's anything, any things here that uh, seem familiar with what we've just read in the book of Revelation. It says, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. 
Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city, and they shall run upon the wall, and they shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble. The sun, the moon, uh, <clears throat> and the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And so we, we see some very close similarities and um, uh, most students and, and Bible scholars and, and whatnot believe that these are overlapping uh, prophecies or, or Joel's describing the very same thing that uh, the book of Revelation is describing in, in there in chapter 9. Uh, <clears throat> the Bible tells us it will be accompanied with the sound of the trumpet. Look at verse uh, uh, 1. It says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Then at verse, in verse 11 it says, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? Uh, <clears throat> and so... In the book of Joel, we find it being referred to as, as the day of the Lord is, is approaching. Look at verse 30. Joel chapter 2, verse 30 says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Um, the this, this sounding of the trumpet uh, precedes the Holy Spirit coming out upon all uh, the pouring out. Uh, I'm sorry, the sound of the trumpet doesn't precede that. The pouring of the Holy Spirit precedes everything. We saw that prophecy fulfilled, or or at least a sample of that prophecy fulfilled in in the first couple chapters of the book of Acts uh, on on the day of Pentecost, as the the early church, the first church, the one that Jesus Himself started, was gathered in the upper room praying as they had been told to tarry in Jerusalem after until they received power from on high. They went out and preached and 3,000 people were saved and baptized as a result of that. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit being poured, about, uh, poured upon them and them speaking in other languages because at that time there was people from all over the world gathered there together and they all heard the gospel in their own language. And that's what the, the miracle of the speaking in tongues is. Uh, now, none of these other terrible things that are described here in the book of Joel, uh, chapter 2, happened at that time. So those things we look to be future events. We look at as, as things that are going to happen. Uh, the, the scorpion uh, uh, locusts that are described in Revelation chapter 9, as we go back there, uh, they have a king. And so ordinary locusts, don't have a king uh, and this king's name is given <clears throat> it says uh, Revelation 9 verse 11 they had a king over them which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon and as I said that's a, a destruction and destroyer now we get to the second woe verse 12 one woe is past and behold there come two, uh, two woes more hereafter. So the, the next woe is, is what we begin to look at. Verse 13, and we'll read from there. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps we'll finish this chapter this evening. Uh, and the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed 
which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols and gold and silver, or, I'm sorry, idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and the wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. And so, <clears throat> in this present age of grace, there are certain demons that are, for all intents and purposes, they're tied up. They're locked up right now. And they would love to torment and kill everybody. But they're held back by God's power. But after the Christians are removed from this world, after the, the rapture of the saints, um, God is going to loose four of them at the sounding of the sixth trumpet, just as a host will be released when the fifth trumpet sounds. So the fifth trumpet sounds and, and a, boy, a, a, a huge number is released. Well, now the sixth trumpet sounds and there's four that are over in the, in the region uh, near the river Euphrates. And we don't know why that particular river, uh, except if we go all the way back and we won't, for the sake of time right now, go back there. But if you look at the, uh, the book of Genesis and the description of the garden in Eden, keep in mind, Eden was a very large area. And then over on the east side of Eden, God planted a very specific garden. And a lot of people call it the Garden of Eden. And, and they think Eden is the whole thing. No, there was a, there was a specific region in that whole area area called Eden and in a smaller area and he planted a, a, a garden there I don't want to say a small garden but he planted a garden there and that's where he put Adam and Eve was in the midst of that garden in Eden so it'd be like like say he put Adam and Eve in Ohio which is located in the United States of America and, and so Ohio is a, a, a very specific location in a much larger region. And, and I'm not saying that, that the region called Eden was as large as, as the United States of America, but I'm just saying that there, there was a, <clears throat> a small area called the Garden, and it was in a larger area called Eden. And if you look there, the river Euphrates flowed through that area. And, and so this is, uh, uh, this, this is very interesting because... Uh, it was here that Satan began his first attack against mankind and, and drove a wedge between them and God. Uh, <clears throat> and, and so he, he, he came to destroy them. Uh, here is where the first murder was committed. And here, uh, if you look forward to Genesis chapter 11, is where the first organized rebellion took place. And so in Revelation chapter 7, we saw four unfallen angels, four angels that have remained loyal to God, restraining judgment until God could seal his servants for his protection. And now we have, by the way, whatever God puts out there, Satan tries to put a counterfeit. So we have, for example, we have the King James Bible, the true words of God, and Satan has innumerable counterfeits out there and and i don't mean just the uh, books that claim to be bibles but other religious books that claim to be the words of god and and so and they form com completely different religions 
And Christians would say, oh, well, I'm not going to have any part with those religions. They're obviously wrong. But so many Christians and so many of God's people have no problem picking up a false Bible because they don't recognize it as being wrong. Because it's not so obvious as these other ones. They say, well, well, I'm not into human sacrifice. Uh, I'm, I'm an American, so I'm a Christian. Uh, well, being American doesn't make you Christian. Uh, being a child of God makes you part of his family. And being born again, born into his family, it requires a second birth, a spiritual birth. And, and so <clears throat> um, Satan has these counterfeits and, and people will pick up these counterfeits and think they have the real thing. Study the real thing. And that's the best way to, to spot a counterfeit. So, but, so Satan copies. Whatever God has, Satan copies. And, and so now we have these, far, uh, these four fallen angels. Boy, uh, my tongue's all twisted up tonight. These four fallen angels are released. And they're released for the purpose of executing God's judgment. Uh, and their activity begins at the very location where it all began 6,000 years ago uh, uh, with Satan uh, tempting Adam and Eve and deceiving Eve and Adam fell for the temptation and, and chose Eve over God that day and disobeyed God in eating of the forbidden fruit. But keep in mind, as bad as things seem here in Revelation chapter 9, it's all still very much under God's control. See, God said, release those angels. Release those four fallen angels. They've been tied up somewhere uh, in the region of, of the Euphrates River. He didn't have to say that. He didn't have to say, let them go. He could have said, they can stay tied up there forever. Uh, but he did let them go. So all this is, is taking place under God's control, under God's directives. <clears throat> and he is using Satan's host to bring to naught the powers of evil. And keep in mind that Jesus said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. A lot of people think Abraham Lincoln said that. Well, he did. He was quoting the Bible when he said it. And, and so here is is satanic forces, uh, demonic forces, fighting against other satanic forces and authorities, other evils. And, and um, so obviously his house is not going to stand. It's going to fall. There's something else we know about the Euphrates River. Uh, God made an unconditional covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. He said, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river Euphrates unto the river of Egypt. And so there's a region in there uh, between the Euphrates River all the way to Egypt. And God said, that belongs to Abraham and his descendants. Uh, and so the Euphrates River was a boundary of the territory which God gave to Israel. It's a very coveted portion of land. Um, and there's a large amount of uh, wealth to be uh, to be found there. And there's a lot of nations that would love to control that region, but God has promised it to his people. And so he's going to protect it for them. And that wasn't a promise that he made just one time. He made it to Abraham and he made it to Isaac and he made it to Jacob. And then he made it to all the sons of, of Jacob after um, he changed his name to Israel. He, he, he confirmed that covenant and that that promise that he made with them. Um, it's very likely there's greedy hands prepared to seize Palestine about the time, and we say Palestine, uh, Israel, the, the land of Israel, the land that truly belongs to Israel. If you look at a map now and compare that with what God described that he's going to give to Abraham, the map of the nation of Israel is, is smaller than the territory that God said, this is yours, Abraham, and it's, it's yours and to your descendants. And, and so uh, they've tried evermore to encroach upon it. By the way, Satan has always wanted to, to rule Israel. 
and, and you can study the history of where uh, Islam came from. And <clears throat> Islam was a, uh, the, the whole thing was for them to take over Israel. Muhammad was supposed to hand it over to the Catholic Church and he double crossed them. And so then the Catholic Church launched the Crusades not to free Israel, but to take it away from the Muslims uh, because they got double crossed. They had been funded, they had been trained um, by the Jesuits, and then they, they, got, they got strong, powerful, well funded, well trained and turned upon uh, the, the people that had organized them to begin with. And, and Satan still wants Israel because there's prophecies that concern Israel about the Savior, about the, uh, the King of Kings, about Jesus sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. And he says, if I can, if I can uh, get that throne and sit on it there and rule from there, maybe he thinks those prophecies will become about him and then he can rule. Uh, but uh, no matter where he sits, those prophecies will never apply to him. And, and so there's much going on right now to try to take over that region of the world. These four fallen angels, these four demonic personages, they go about to slay a third of the human race. And I looked it up uh, just, just before we started tonight. Right now we're sitting at the world population about 7.9 billion people. So it won't be long till we're at 8 billion. Let's just round that up to 8 billion. One third of 8 billion comes out to 2.6 billion people. Now this is the sixth trumpet out of seven. This happens during a, a period of time that we call the seven year tribulation. We don't know at, at what point on that timeline this happens, uh, but we do know it happens within seven years. So even if, if the, <clears throat> excuse me, even if this trumpet is spread out for a full seven years, that's not very much time within which to lose a full third of the world's population. Imagine, imagine from 2015 till now, if we had lost a third of our population, that's a huge, huge event. That's, I mean, that's, that's something we have a hard time uh, imagining or understanding how that could happen. But that's going to happen here with the sixth angel. That's a, that, that's a tremendous, tremendous uh, amount of power that's unleashed there. It, it happens at an exact time known only to God. The Bible says in verse 15, it says, The four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. Now, I don't know if that means it takes a, uh, uh, 13 months and an hour, <clears throat> or 13 months plus a day and an hour. I don't think it means that. I think it means there's a specific year. And within that specific year, there's a specific month. Within that specific month, there's a specific uh, day. And within that specific day, there's a specific hour that these four angels are going to be released. It's already scheduled, and it's, it's on God's calendar, and it's going to be carried out exactly according to his schedule. He will bring his program to pass, uh, and he holds the reins of the world's government in his own hands. Uh, there's an immense army that, that appears, and it's an army of 200 million horsemen. Uh, it, it's the combined power of the devil and men acting in their own interest. Yet, at the same time, in their own ignorance, they're carrying out God's will and plan. It, it may seem like everything is under Satan's control, but God is the one that's moving everything after the counsel of his own will. Now, this army of the two, uh, 200 million uh, seems to be a supernatural army. The description of it doesn't, uh, doesn't match the description uh, of, of something that's, that's manufactured by man or, or naturally occurring either. Uh, 
uh, and, and God has certainly put supernatural armies in, in, into play in the past, and he can do it again. Um, we're going to pause right here, and we're going to pick up next week with a description of this army, uh, and I think we'll, we'll very likely finish up chapter 9 uh, next week. Let's stand, we'll close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for <clears throat> being a God that is right and just in his actions. And God, we, we pray that uh, as we study, you would help us to understand you better, to know you more. And Lord, that it would motivate us to tell others about you and your great love for us. And as we leave here, we pray that you take us safely uh, from this place. Return us again safely. Bless the services on Sunday. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Lord bless you.